Welcome back to another episode of How to RP1, and we're just gonna dive right into it. First of all, we need to go over to the research and development area and go ahead and go over a few things. So let's go there now. So now that we're in the R&D building, our main goal in the next few years is to unlock orbital rocketry. But we can't do that until we unlock the next material science node. So even though I have enough science to unlock orbital rocketry, I have to do the next material science node first. I'm going to go ahead and grab that while we're in here. And go over a few more things you may want to look at. Like example, these probes are going to make your life a lot easier, especially because of the Sputnik probe. As well as unlock batteries so we can keep our satellites in orbit a little bit longer so we can get more science out of them. The other thing I wanted to touch on is air launch upgrades. Now, you see that like looking cockpit, that like big B-52 looking cockpit in there? That's not actually a part, that's an air launch upgrade. There is a cockpit that has the same like emblem on it, but when you click on it, you can see the difference. Buying these will allow us to do bigger, higher and faster air launches. I'm gonna go ahead and purchase those now because we're gonna need them later down the road. If you aren't gonna be doing X-Planes, go ahead and just skip over this bit. It's not that important, but I'll be covering some x -plane stuff in this series, so we're gonna buy it. The other thing is that next cockpit upgrade, it is that in fact an upgrade, it's not a new part. Once you buy it, which you have to do in the R&D building, the current cockpit you're using will just automatically be upgraded. I hope that makes sense. Now, even though the orbital rocketry tab is only gonna cost us seven more points, we do need to remember that there are other things we have to unlock. We need to unlock the first electric tab, the big one, as well as the very bottom science tab on the next, which has a Geiger counter, which we need so we can do the first scientific satellite. So in reality, we need to at least get 24 more points of science before we have everything we need before we can do the first major satellite contract. We can do the artificial satellite contract, but in order to actually really start making money, we need to make sure we get all three of those tabs. Let's hop back over to the Space Center. Now real quickly, since in the last episode we gave two of our pilots the proficiency training for the X-1 cockpit, we're going to go ahead and get the other two started on it as well. That way all four of them can actually do X-plane missions if we want them to. But what we're going to really get into is advanced contracts, because there are other things than just sounding downrange contracts and altitude contracts. And these ones not only pay more, they also give you more science. So we're going to hop over to Mission Control, we're going to talk about them. Now you should have this low space film and biological contract unlocked, and basically it's, it's as simple as it seems. It's basically a, the low space film is a downrange return contract, but it involves having a low uh, a film camera, which we're going to show you how to attach in just a second. And the other one's the same thing except for it's a biological sample capsule. Now you have to recover the biological sample capsule to get any science out of it, which makes downrange ones the better way to do it. But the first one we're going to do is actually going to be just a straight shot up, just to kind of explain to you how it works. A key thing to remember is you can't stack the sounding rocket contracts with these advanced contracts. As soon as you accept one, the rest will go away. So there's no way to do multiple contracts at one time. It's just how the RP-1 thing's set up. So keep that in mind before you accept anything. Now you can do this next part any way you want. I prefer just to go into the edit function and we're gonna edit our Mac Corp E2 rocket, the altitude rocket, and make a base based off that. You could also just load the craft inside the VAB but let's go over to the VAB now. Now this next part is going to be pretty straightforward. We're going to take off the bottom of the rocket. We're going to attach to the biological sample unit to the telemetry unit. Tuck it back into the nose cone. Reapply the parachute. And then put the bottom of the rocket back on. And that's it. That's all we really have to do. But since we have some upgrades unlocked, we're going to go ahead and do some upgrades. There's a couple of ways you can do this, you can fish around for it. I just set my root part back to the telemetry unit so I can pull the nose cone up. That way I can kind of stack everything together easier. 
And how you do this is completely up to you. As long as you can attach the biological unit to the rocket, you are good to go. So now that we have it all separated, it's pretty simple. We're just going to kind of remove this real fast. We're going to go to the science tab. We're going to unlock the biological sample unit. It's in here somewhere. And we're just going to slap it on top. And then just put it back together. Now again, the other biological sample unit, the little uh, mystery goo looking thing, it does the same thing. You can use either one, but it's just easier to use a smaller profile one in my opinion. But either way, you can use either one you want. I'm gonna fast forward through this next part because it's just me OCD level putting this rocket back together because I want that parachute centered and it's no reason to play at normal speed. Anyways, once we get this rocket together, it's time to do the upgrades. And we're going to start off with the very first uh, RD-101 upgrade here. It's going to cost $5,000. We have the money right now, so let's go ahead and spend it. But because of this, we need to make a bigger tank on the rocket because we want to actually get better performance out of it. And right now we have a way higher uh, burn time, but we're not using nearly enough of it. Now you don't want to try to max out the 85 seconds, you definitely can if you want to, but if you're going to keep these at a slimmer profile for the camera unit, then you just got a really long, like, 12 meter rocket, it looks kind of silly. You can if you want to, or you can skip out the camera contracts, it's up to you. I'm just kind of showing you guys a really good way to start doing these contracts early on. You always make the, uh, the rockets wider later. But there's no real point to doing that until you start getting into orbital rocketry. Now, if you want to take it slower and just kind of do more and more sounding rockets, feel free to, you know, make a wider, wider version of the rocket. But once you're all happy with the setup you have going, go ahead and adjust the tanks, do small tweaks, and of course, as always, run it and crash. We're going to keep the RD-101, and we're actually going to make the tank... Uh, nine and a half meters just to get a little more burn time out of it because it won't be too long to cause any instability yes there'll be tooling costs but it's, it's a very minor amount of tooling cost and we'll actually make that money back we'll make all the money actually back from everything we just spent in here in the first launch of this rocket plus some as long as it's, it's a successful launch because it is a you know more reliable rocket i'm pretty confident that it is going to be successful so let's go ahead and move on to the next part of the video. So we renamed and got that rocket in queue. Now we're going to be editing the downrange version of the Big Mac Corpy. We're going to attach a camera to this, which is 1.25 meters, which is why, again, I set this up. I'm going to go ahead and make some quick adjustments to the tank size and the engine and kind of match everything from the rocket we just built. And then we're gonna go ahead and add the camera to it. It's pretty straightforward how to do this. You just kind of remove the tank. Um, I pulled a parachute off because we want the parachute on the bottom of the camera. We're gonna slap a camera on to the bottom of that nose cone, reattach the parachute, and then put the decoupling unit and rocket back on the bottom. Like a lot of experiments, there are certain areas where you have to kind of uh, they have to be at a certain distance above the ground, or if they go too high, some won't work. If you actually hit that little clipboard tab in the crash screen, um, it will actually tell you the requirements for the scientific experiment to work. Early game ones are pretty easy, but once you get later on in the game, they do definitely get a little bit more complex. Um, a lot of them have a very certain um, requirements to be used correctly. But now that we have our parachute, I mean, yeah, parachute back on, we're going to go ahead and just make sure it's still set up to be good. We're going to attach the decoupler and the bite base of the rocket back down to the camera. Make sure our staging's all good. And we also ran this in crash a few times as well. I usually recommend trying to get this to work and hit about 500-ish meters down range and hit an altitude of at least like 180,000. Again, adjust your tip like the last time we went over this in episode 2, I believe. And just follow that same pattern for this. I'm going to give it some generic name. And then we're going to go ahead and move on to the next part. Now off screen, I went ahead and made my two downrange and uh, altitude sounding rockets. I just matched the 9.5 tanks and upgraded the engine. So they're all the same now. 
I didn't think you guys would want to watch me go through that. It's pretty generic. Edit them, lengthen them, save them, move on. We're going to stagger them out like before. Uh, I'm going to rename a few of these real fast just to kind of get them organized. And in just a moment, we're going to phase over and launch the first biological uh, sounding rocket contract. I'll kind of show, explain to you guys how that science works and how to best farm with it. We're going to go over the actual X-plane and landing, which didn't go as well as I wanted it to, but it's not bugging out on me, so that's cool. We'll do one of the film launches, and then we're going to talk about the downrange 3000 kilometer launch, which is actually fairly simple. I'm going to show you guys a really easy way to do it. You only need a few things unlocked, which we already have them unlocked. So let's go ahead and get back to the launch pad and do our very first advanced biological, or I guess advanced sounding rocket contract. And once again, we find ourselves back at the launch pad. I thought the sunrise looked kind of cool, so I wanted to shoot this a little cinematic-y. Anyways, I tested this rocket and crashed already. I know it can do the re-entry thing. The whole goal is to shoot this up as high as possible so we can collect a bunch of science. And then recover the biological sample unit inside that nose cone. I'm going to go ahead and speed through a lot of this launch. There's a few things I want to talk about. But mostly I just wanted to, to do a really cool cinematic uh, shot right there. Anyways, before you launch, you see this little window right here? If all the requirement checkboxes aren't checked off, don't do the launch because it means you can't do it. Uh, you may have forgotten the sounding payload, you may have forgotten to you know, launch the right rocket, there's a few things. But always check that before you actually hit the launch button, that way it's not a wasted launch. You're going to notice here how it says invalid situation, and it's because I'm not in space yet. Once we hit that 140 kilometer mark, and we've officially entered space, that biological sample will actually kick on. I say as I take a thumbnail when it happens. Anyways, as soon as you come back down below the 140 uh, kilometer mark, it will no longer work anymore. So there's only a certain amount of time it's going to actually run the experiment, which is why I like to do the very first launch at the higher altitude setup so we get more hang time with the rocket. But now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna fast forward this thing back down and we're gonna go ahead and land it. And we're gonna get a bunch of science from this. In fact, we get a little over half of what we need to get to our orbital rocketry stuff. Which is very important with the whole RP-1 thing. You need to be able to balance funds and science. There will be some launches you do just to get science and some you'll just do to get funds. But early on, you want to try and, you know, get both of them as much as you can so you can get more advanced technology and in turn move farther in the game. And keep in mind, if you haven't made it this far at the point we're at, don't be discouraged. It takes a lot of practice. You will eventually get the hang of it. But now let's go over and talk X-Planes. Before jumping into the first flight, we're going to go ahead and grab some contracts. I'm going to go ahead with the low space film return because I want to get some money to get some upgrades going. And then I'm going to grab the break the sound barrier contract. It's a milestone contract. It'll be worth more and we can definitely achieve it. It's fairly simple. Get over a certain speed for at least 30 seconds. The plane's capable of it. We'll be able to do that one easily, so even if we don't get any other milestone achievements or we have to eject the cockpit, we'll still get a nice little chunk of funding from this and be able to at least upgrade our station further. We also need to go ahead and actually do the mission training real fast for Ziggy Kerman, and I'm going to talk to you guys about how the air launch system works, and then we're going to actually air launch. I sped this part up because I'm just kind of upgrading my, uh, you know, VAB and my R&D building. And then we're going to fast forward and finish building the X-Plane, get it prepped for air launch, which is essentially like a rollout thing. And then we'll go ahead and get our Kerbals trained. You just have to click 
prep for air launch. A little timer will pop up. You can fast forward through it if you want. But we need to go ahead and get ready to train our pilots. So back to the RO screen or the RP1 screen. Go back to courses and you'll see mission X1. We're going to go ahead and give it to Ziggy and our other pilots and start the course. Now as you see it's only going to take a few days which is why we're doing it so late. Usually I'd recommend doing this about a month or so beforehand. And we're going to go ahead and quickly just warp forward again. And we're going to get ready to air launch. Now a little screen's going to pop up and it's the same screen we looked at in Crash. But real quickly I wanted to talk about the astronaut screen. So we're going to open up Ziggy Kerman's thing. And there's going to be some information on there. The first thing, we're going to notice that Ziggy Kerman's training expires eventually. Um, training expires, proficiency does not. And then you're going to see the, the net retirement and then the other retirement, NLT, I believe is what it is. And that's basically the maximum time you can keep a Kerbal. The more times you let them fly, send them to space, do cool contracts, the longer they'll stay with the program. That's why doing X-Planes is a good idea because usually by the time you get to human space flight, all of these guys will be retired because you haven't done anything with them. So if you can do X-Plane contracts and you want to do the plane stuff, it's really good because you get to keep a hold of all of these guys, as well as don't have to worry about buying more later down the road. But now that that's out of the way, let's go ahead and actually air launch the ship. And as I said before, the same screen you saw in Crash will pop up. We're just going to set this up real quick. And we're going to go ahead and phase over to the actual launch. There's a few things I want to show you before the launch actually happens. And let's go ahead and do that now. So you'll first spawn on the launch pad. I paused it real fast because there's a little timer you'll see up, see up on the top corner that counts down to the air launch. If you click on the sidebar stuff and then pause it, you can make adjustments with the pop-out menus. So if you need to make a quick change to your you know, autopilot stuff or make sure your science is turned on or you want to set up your camera tools for a cool shot, the best way to do it is just kind of have your hand on the escape key and toggle back and forth. Because once you're paused, it won't do the countdown for the air launch. But it gives you, it's either five or seven seconds until it actually spawns you up in the air. And then once you're there, you're air launched. You need to start focusing on your flight. I thought that just might be some helpful information since um, I wanted to check my atmospheric autopilot stuff anyways because the glitch I was having was FAR and AA were doing some weird colliding thing and I kept setting my roll uh, authority to zero for some reason like I kept dropping it back to zero so I, I kept having to like redo the setting and you'll see me mess around with the settings as I'm flying because I'm trying to keep it from doing it again because I will need to be able to use my roll control to land the plane or steer the plane, bleed off speed, a few things that we're going to go over. Anyways, now that I'm happy with how everything is set up, we're going to go ahead and unpause it and go ahead and do the air launch part. I'll be doing two parts of this flight. We'll do the initial burning of the engine and I'm going to cut forward to the landing because it's like a 10 minute ordeal. But now we're in flight, so we're going to throttle up, we're going to ignite our engine, and have an engine failure, which happens. And don't worry, don't panic. Um, you just got to click on the engine, you got to right click on the engine, and it's activate engine, and it should reignite it. Again, you got four ignitions on this engine, so an ignition failure isn't the end of the world. Now if you only had one ignition, then you'd be in a little bit of trouble because there's no way we could glide back to the space center this way. But because of that little ignition issue, we lost some speed, so I don't start pitching up as soon as I normally would. But again, we're going to go ahead and just adjust our throttle back to where we're still gaining speed while slowly tipping back. My goal was to hit the 15 kilometer mark, hit 600 meters a second, and complete the contract. If you don't feel like you can do all of that, take your time with it. You can always launch another X-plane. I'm just trying to get a bunch of funding together so I can start upgrading things further. Now everything you're watching is being played back at times two speed. Don't worry if you don't accelerate this fast. It's just a, it's a it's a bit of a process. But anyways, like before we're just gonna pitch up 
I'll try to keep it under 30 degrees. Once I see my predicted AP is about 12k ish, I'm gonna start pointing down, staying in that prograde marker. We want to force the prograde marker down because that's the most efficient way to fly, and we're still picking up speed as we go. We only have to get over that 343 meter second for 30 seconds. It's super easy. We'll do that before we even finish our ascent. And then once we get to about 14, 8, 15 kilometers, I'm going to hammer the throttle down, continue to pitch down, and try to hit that 600 meters a second. A little spoiler, we do hit the 600 meters a second, and just barely, like we hit 602, I believe. It was a very close call. And then once we get to this, our engine's going to burn out and we're going to start losing speed. And just like before, we're just going to kind of hold our glide in altitude. Once we get a little bit closer to the space center, we'll start nosing down some more because we don't want to bleed off too much speed. But we also don't want to be too high before we get to the landing area. So usually I'll just kind of slowly pitch down as I go and just slowly try to you know get my altitude lower to the ground while maintaining speed but not picking up too much speed. So we're gonna go ahead and cut forward to when we're closer to the island and we're about to land. Now that we're back to the shore, or getting close to the shore, we're gonna go ahead and try to bleed off some speed. A really good way to do this without making air brakes or unlocking air brakes yet, you can tip your plane to the side you want to try to keep it as uh, level as you can between the orange and the blue, which I'm terrible at. And kind of pitch one direction and pitch back to the next direction. What you're basically doing is creating more drag using your wing profile to slow yourself down without doing it too much. A lot of this will be played back in times two or times four speed. Don't be as aggressive. Like, it's, they're slow turns. You don't need to go super fast. Just enough to kind of bleed off some meters a second here and there, and they tend to add up after a while. You can also do a big loop turn, but if you don't have enough speed for that, you'll stall your plane out, which we almost end up doing here in a minute. I started my bleed off a little too early, so by the time I got down to the runway, I was going way too fast. I was moving at about 180 meters a second, which is entirely too fast. I knew that I wouldn't be able to hit the runway right about here, so I decided we were going to go ahead and try to do a quick turnaround. Unfortunately, again, the big turn I made bled off too much speed, so I was forced to do a grass landing, which will happen, and it will probably happen a few times until you get a little bit more used to flying these planes. Now, if you are playing with quick saves and reverts, um, about where I started the video, I'd recommend making a quick save. That way you can come back and try it again. Again, we have reverts and quick saves turned off. So that's why I had to kind of improvise on the landing. Uh, I wanted to try to do a good run runway landing for you guys, but I'm also keeping true to the fact that I'm not going to revert a quick save. So this is where we're at. Anyways, I started to kind of push myself to the left a little bit so I can make a nice big right turn. And as you see, my speed's getting dangerously low on this turn, and I knew that if I kept this up, I'd stall the plane. So my better bet was just to get kind of low, bleed off as much speed as I can, and try to find a nice flat spot on the grass. I wanted to get closer to 70 meters a second, but I did it a little bit early. As you can see, I'm slightly tipped back, but not very much. I have my brakes turned off because sometimes they'll crack it out. And I'm going to deploy the parachutes pretty much as right before I land. And then once I slow down a little bit, I'll activate the brakes. Uh, sometimes the brakes will be a little aggressive, even if, even if you turn them down. And they'll cause you to like jerk forward and flip and blow up. But there you have it. We landed the plane. I hit the camera stools button on accident. And yeah, that happened. The next thing we're going to talk about is the proper way to recover a plane. You've probably seen the recovered SPH and recover normal recovery so far. Normally just hit the normal recovery, but in this instance we want to go to re recover to SPH because this will actually allow us to reuse the plane. I'll go over that in a little bit. Now that we're back to the Space Center, you see that the screw update thing popped up. It was the uh, basically saying that 
Ziggy Kerman's retirement date has been pushed back. It also shows that he went on vacation. It's usually no more than a week, but you can't do anything with them in that little time frame while they're on quote unquote vacation. It adds a little realism to it. I actually believe that's part of Crew Manifest, not RP1. I'm not 100% sure since I've always used both of them together. But the bigger and the more milestones and the, the cooler the mission, the longer that retirement date will be pushed back. This gave us a few extra months, but like when you first put someone into orbit, they'll stay for like another year and a half. Like it's, it does get increasingly, uh, the, the distance gets, the time gets a lot more increased over, you know, depending on what kind of mission it is. I'm not sure how to say that. I also have Final Frontier. If you don't, don't worry about that menu. But over in the space plane hangar, you're gonna see this time to recovery deal. Once that's recovered, we can prep that for air launch and launch it again. Now, because I have a mod called Scrapyard, I have to actually fill the tanks and swap the engine out every so often. If you're not using Scrapyard, you don't have to worry about that. It's a mod I use for a little extra realism. I don't recommend it for new players, but it is kind of a cool mod if you wanted to check it out. It's called Scrapyard. You can use uh, K-Chan to download it or just download it normally. Let's go ahead and pop over to the VAB though and talk downrange rocket because we're already about 27 minutes into this video. Now, to sum this next rocket up, we're basically going to put a uh, Mac Corpy onto a Big Mac Corpy, or however I named the first rocket. The very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the top of this and I'll make it exactly 3.3 uh, meters in diameter, because we're going to use a decoupler that is also 0.3 meters in diameter, and we're basically going to remake the very first rocket we ever did. We're just going to strap it to the top of our current sounding rocket. As simple as that sounds, that's that's all we're really doing. There will be some differences because we're going to actually update and use the AJ-1027 variant of the Aerobe engine, which you get with the second rocket tree tree unlock. I'm pretty sure it's the second rocket tree tree unlock. And we're going to be using the uh, high pressure aluminum tanks instead. In fact, we're, we're going to upgrade the, the base of the rocket as well. And we can go ahead and use the new upgraded base rocket to use it as a better sounding rocket later on. Now, the only difference is I'm going to be using uh, the 0.3 meter diameter, uh, sorry, 0.38 meter diameter rocket, uh, just because I don't want it to be too long. Um, if you use the second variant, you can use the 0.3 and it still works. So if you don't have the AJ-10 variant unlocked, it's fine. But having the um, AJ-10 variant, not only is it more efficient, it's a better engine, it's also more reliable, which is why I like to use that one instead. If you're doing like a speed run or like a, like a rush play to get to orbital as fast as possible, then you'll, you can do this as soon as you unlock the first material science and the first rocketry tab. It's technically possible to do the downrange uh, contract. I actually do it in my very first Ash video if you want to see how I did that. I think I did it in like five launches. Uh, we're not doing that today. Today we are going over the basics, you know, learning things and how to get going. Now I did pull that telemetry unit out of the nose cone. You don't have to do that, it's just something I do. It won't really save that much weight. It will save a little bit but not that much. And we're basically going to just design this top rocket to basically meet the burn time of the engine we have, which is, is 52 seconds. Um, I actually push it to 54 seconds because I always like a little extra wiggle room. But in the end, the only thing you need to worry about is that you have about 6,000 meters a second total delta V. No matter how you design this rocket, you can copy this one. I'm actually going to put the the craft file in the description of this video. If you just want to copy this one and use it, that's fine by me. If you just want to play around with it, that's also fine by me. The whole point is build something that you like that can do the job. Again, this was meant to be more of a generalized how-to, not really a straightforward like career guide. So 
I did have a little bit of a glitch with the uh, the burn time on the Delta V reader, so I kind of go back and forth here in a second, and it, it eventually fixes itself. But in the end, we have we actually almost have 7,000 Delta V like at, overall at, at the very end of all of this, which isn't necessary. But again, I always overbuild all of my rockets just in case, because if this burns out, you know, seven or eight seconds too early, it should still be able to complete the contract. The other nice thing is you don't have to recover this. It is going to blow up because you're going to be going really fast when you re-enter the atmosphere. That's fine. As long as part of the rocket gets over the 3,000 kilometer range, you finalize the contract and it's complete. Depending on how you do this, you'll get a bunch of milestones as well and you can make a lot of money, which is really nice because not only did you get your first major milestone done, you also make a ton of funding to really upgrade your R&D center. I mean, your space center in general. That way you can get more stuff unlocked, build stuff faster. And unfortunately, the next year is the year 1953, typically. And it is a grindy year. We're going to do a small video on that. But the next big How to RP1 video is going to be going orbital for the first time. I didn't want to just leave like a big gap in the center of it, so I will do like a very small mini-sode in between, just to kind of explain to you, you know, kind of what you're going to end up running into once you get the downrange contract done if your orbital rocketry tech is not finished, well, I guess researching, which is mainly just, you know, shooting a bunch of sounding rockets and grinding a bunch of money out is, is really what it comes down to. You can build this however you want, have 6,000 meters a second total. I'm gonna make give it a slight tilt. I run this in crash off screen. You guys have seen me use crash enough times to know how to use it. I have faith in you by this point that you guys can use it, as well as you understand the general basic idea of how to build rockets. This is no different. Make sure the center lip doesn't go over the center of mass when the tank's empty. Make sure you don't exceed your burn time too much. Make sure your delta V is at least 6,000 and make sure your starting thruster weight ratio is at least, I'm gonna say 2.3 for this rocket. But as I said before, I'm gonna go ahead and upload this craft file just to, just so you guys can play around with it or use it, I, I don't really care. As long as you're learning something, that's the main point of these videos. We are gonna skip a launch, which is basically the camera launch we do. It's the same thing as the suborbital contract just with a camera play around with it um, just make sure you can meet the requirements I want you guys to build your own rockets um, again general guide either way we're gonna make some quick tweaks and then we're gonna go ahead and get ready to switch over to the launch pad and just launch this right away and as always if you have any questions feel free to let me know in the comments I will do my best to address them I just don't want these videos to drag out too much. Right now I'm just doing the final tests and checks of the rockets. But we're going to go ahead and switch over to the launch pad now and get ready to launch our first 3K downrange rocket. So now that we're on the launch pad, we're going to go ahead like normal and turn all of our science experiments on. Um, at this point, we pretty much have all of these basic ones wrapped up. But you never know, and it's always nice to get a little bit more science out of something if you can. I'm going to go ahead and collapse a lot of these just so we can focus on the downrange one. And we're going to fire the rocket up and get ready to launch. I'm going to play the first part of this in real time to kind of show you how I do this. Because like the first rocket, we need to provide some sort of ollage for the Aero B stage which requires us to be kind of moving as we ignite it, which is why we have the engine staged before the decoupler. Sometimes you can get away with just doing them at the same time, but I find it works best when you ignite it and then decouple it right after. I recommend aiming for two seconds before the RD engine is about done burning, which is why we have the tab pulled out below. We can see how much time it has left on its burn once this is two seconds, we're going to stage, basically count to one, and stage again. Now, you are going to see some explosions. That's totally fine. 
I would recommend practicing this particular decoupling technique and crash a bit just so you can kind of get the understanding of it. But now we're coming up to the spot we need to get ready to stage and decouple. And again, you're going to stage it at the two second mark and then decouple it pretty much right afterwards. If done correctly, you should see the explosion kind of like that. The rocket should burn out and the arrow bee should kind of push the smaller rocket off the edge. This is a little bit more of a, an upwards aggressive tip, but again, we've overbuilt this rocket, so we don't have to be focusing too much on being, you know, flatter like you would when you're trying to get into orbit. The upside to this is we're going to get, like, I think it's 2,000 kilometers above the surface, so we're going to hit a bunch of milestones, and we're going to break that 3K mark before we're ever re-entering the atmosphere, which is what we want. That was the main goal. So I'm going to go ahead and speed this up a little bit because there's not really much to talk about or watch. Uh, but it does take a little while for this flight to kind of go through. I think it's like 11 minutes in game time. I time warp through most of this. But we're going to slow it down. And you're going to see that we've completed, we're just about to complete that 3,000 kilometer range. A good way to tell if you're okay is if you're over the 1,500 mark before you reach the top of your orbit because that should be about half at this point if you want you could just blow it up you don't have to recover it but I like explosions so I figured we do a little bit of slow motion action and watch some things go boom So at this point you should have made your 3,000 kilometer rocket be a thing. We made a quarter million dollars in total with all of our funding. That is a nice little chunk of change especially this early on in the game. When we come back we're going to be talking about these satellite contracts. We're not going to accept them yet because they have a very short time limit. We do have everything we need starting to research but it's not done yet. I usually wait or recommend waiting until you have most of it researched before accepting the contract. You will need a lot of the money to buy a lot of the parts. We're getting into the part of the game where things start costing a lot more money. It's not just like, oh, a $3,000 here, $5,000 there. It's more or less like, oh, this is a $45,000 engine. This costs $20,000 to upgrade. And your tooling costs are also going to get a lot more expensive. Keep that in mind. But at that point, I'm going to go ahead and call the episode. I want to thank you guys again for stopping by. I hope you guys learned at least something, or at least I hope I explained things well enough to help you get better on your, uh, I don't know, your mission to play RP1 for the very first time. We will be coming back to all of these cool satellite contracts uh, when we get orbital. Again, I'm going to do that filler episode to kind of explain what to do while you wait for the stuff to research. But other than that, the episode is over. Uh, as always, I'll put the link to Carnassus Discord in the description if you haven't joined it already. I'll have the craft file for the 3K down range rocket also in the description as well as links to other YouTubers I recommend you watch. But at this point, I'm going to go ahead and stop talking now, and I hope I see you guys in the next chapter of How to RP1. <laughs>